Good morning, everybody. Um, that is a good morning if you're in the UK, of course. If you're in another part of the world, we may be saying good afternoon or good evening. Um, my name is Professor Karma Clancy, and I'm your host and facilitator for this webinar on Mental Health World Day. So um, you're very, very welcome to the webinar. I hope we have a great lineup for you. I'm just looking at the numbers settling in. Hopefully everybody is through the virtual door and starting to settle into your seat and into your screen. Um, so sit back and hopefully enjoy. Um, I've just got to go through a couple of announcements so that we all know where we are and what we're doing. So first and foremost, um, obviously we're here to celebrate World Mental Health Day. Uh, make mental health and well-being for all a global priority. It's, uh, this webinar is facilitated by ISAP UK, which is hosted by Middlesex University, which is where I'm based as both a dean of a faculty, but also a professor in addictions and mental health. But I'm really pleased to tell you that we have three perspectives this morning, and we're looking at this particular subject through the lens of our colleagues in Indonesia, in Pakistan, and also in the UK. So we hope this webinar will highlight a range of challenges and responses from each country and we will also invite you at some point towards the end of this webinar uh, to take part in a questions and answers session. So we really welcome your questions and perspectives to enrich the discussion. So as you are listening, please just take a, a pen and paper, make some notes and then pop the questions in uh, into the, into the Q&A uh, bar at the side of the webinar. So a little bit about ISIP. If you're new to ISIP and you've never met ISIP before, um, ISIP stands for the International Society for Substance Use Professionals. It's a membership organization uh, with over currently 27,000 members worldwide working in the fields of substance use prevention, treatment and recovery care. The aim of the society is to connect professionals through networking, knowledge exchange and training, sharing the very best in evidence from evidence-based, I should say, ethical approaches and promoting quality in all areas of prevention, treatment and recovery care practice. And if you're not familiar or you're not currently yet a member, please do go to the highlighted website uh, there on your screen. Um, good news is that membership is free. So all you have to do is go and check out the website and sign up. And do, of course, let your colleagues know that this is available for them as well. And you will find a wealth of resources and publications for you to enjoy. So a little bit of housekeeping. You will, as I said earlier, have the opportunity to submit text questions to the presenters by typing your questions into the questions panel webinar interface on your screen. You can send those questions at any time during the presentation. And we will be collating and putting those into probably categories and themes as we go through. I have two wonderful colleagues working with me, Kirsty and Olivia from the ISAP uh, office who are sitting in the background uh, of this presentation and they will be supporting us. And of course, this recording of the webinar will be made available um, on demand after the event. And we hope that you will disseminate it sort of wide and far. So a little bit about me, just in case you can't see me on screen, um, this is me. Um, I will be the facilitator. As I mentioned, I'm currently Dean of Faculty for Health and Social Care and Education at Middlesex University. My professional background is nursing, and I'm also a professor of mental health and addictions. Um, and I'm particularly keen and interested in this subject because I actually came over 20 years ago to the university to set up the first master's in dual diagnosis. Um, uh, which is a pathway program from, from a PG cert right through to the master's, which remains an active program of study and is open to national and international students. And of course, we uh, you can come in person, but you can also study this particular master's online. So if you do want to know more about that information, you can, of course, just go to the website of Middlesex University. Uh, or if you want, you can always contact me directly after the webinar. So what are we talking about? So I'm setting the scene a little bit before I hand over to my colleagues for their three uh, presentations. And I think if you're not familiar with the subject, one of the things that you will immediately note is that there are many, many terms. And that is often quite confusing because there are a variety of terms that are used depending on which country you reside or work in, or indeed what literature, whether you're reading Australian type literature or literature out of the US or the UK. And you will note, for example, that these are just some of the different types of terms that are used to describe what in effect we're talking about, which is co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. Okay, so we're talking about two 
two problems. Sometimes you often hear people call it double trouble. Um, it's a bit negative, but ultimately it's really what people are saying is that there are two things coexisting together. So you have terms such as dual diagnosis, dual meaning two, uh, comorbidity, coexisting mental health and substance use, or coinciding mental illness and substance abuse, coexisting problems, co-occurring disorders, and concurrent disorders. So if you're doing a search around this particular subject after this uh, webinar, you could put in any one of those as search terms and you certainly will get lots and lots of information and, and, and evidence. How big is the challenge? Well, unfortunately, it is actually a very significant uh, concern, uh, particularly for those working either in mental health or in substance use, because we know that it's estimated that approximately least uh, three, three, three quarters, 75% of patients with severe mental illness also have a substance use disorder. And that 60% of adults with a substance use disorder have at least one type of serious mental illness. So serious mental illness or substance use disorder is either the cause or the consequence of the other, including social issues leading to both at the same time. So it's quite a complex uh, and complex area to navigate. And of course, on top of which, there are genetic factors for such comorbidity, including variations in how people might respond to treatments um, have also been suggested. So impact, we know, and not surprisingly, uh, those of us who have worked either solely within mental health or in substance misuse, and some of you today on this webinar may just be in one of those areas, you already know the consequences of and the impact of having just one condition or one disorder. So when you have two or co-occurring disorders coming together, you can understand that there's going to be a greater instance of adverse outcomes and sadly including suicide on planned hospital admissions and particularly um, early mortality. Social consequences include, unfortunately, violence, um, certainly significant homelessness, involvement with the criminal justice system, and you know, more impactful the re relationship breakdowns, both with, with friends, but of course with family. So what are the response frameworks to date? Um, some of you will know that historically, when people were perhaps less informed, um, that there were things called partial, sequential, or parallel. And those three particular approaches, as you can see described on the screen, with partial, it means that the treatment that was being offered only treats the disorder identified as primary. So if somebody came through a mental health services door, they would, even if they had substance misuse, the team would probably just be dealing with psychiatric condition in front of them. And conversely, if they went through a substance misuse service, they would only deal with the substance misuse rather than the co-occurring psychiatric condition that may also be in play. Um, sequential is where the treatment team would say, well, we'll treat the primary disorder first and then treat the secondary, i.e. we will come to that after and vice versa. We will treat the substance use disorder first and then think about what to do with the mental health presentation. And then parallel is where you may have two services, one in the addiction side and one on the mental health side, and they're actually managing both conditions almost in a siloed way, separately, um, but are handled by the two different providers. So there's no real cohesiveness in terms of overall looking at the picture. And of course, the preferred and now understandably recognized as the evidence-based approach that gives us the best outcomes is what we call integrated treatment which is where both conditions are treated as the primary condition. We're recognizing that the interplay between both is something new, different, and needs to be treated as one thing. So the integrated and inclusive care model, we know leads to significant reductions in substance use, improvement in psychiatric symptoms, quality of life, as well as social outcomes. Conversely, those traditional cultures where you deal with things separately or in a sequential way, unfortunately lead to poor outcomes and moreover treatment failure. So these are really two key messages. We're talking about an integrated inclusive response rather than seeing these things as separate entities. And if you are somebody with, as they say, the right brain thinker or a creative type, just to hone in on that message, if you can imagine as an artist, you have the paint, yellow paint and you have blue paint and blue represents substance use disorder and yellow represents mental health disorder. 
if you take your both paints and merge them together into one pot, it comes out as green. So those of you who are creative this morning, you understand and will recognize that. And that's really what we're talking about, that it isn't just one or the other. It isn't a blue condition or a yellow condition. It's actually something new. It's a green condition. And you need to understand it in that way if we're really going to have any impact. If you are a left brain thinker, just for those who are more logical in their approach, see it in a mathematical uh, equation. So therefore, if you are somebody thinking, oh, it's just mental health and substance use, which is often the way it's presented, that is actually not correct. You should see it in a mathematical equation as somebody who has a mental health disorder multiplied by substance use disorder divided by social consequences. So I hope that that kind of helps you get a sense of what we're talking about. This is a very complex area of work. Um, and I'm really absolutely delighted that I now can turn over to our presenters and share with you some of the work where they will be sharing with you some of the work that they are attempting to do through their lens in their respective countries and give you an insight into not only the complexity, but also obviously the solutions to this. So I think my screen is now going to go off as we call on Dr. Dahl, who is our first presenter. So perhaps if my colleagues can do that. And while Dr. Dahl is getting himself set up, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Dahl, who is a consultant senior psychiatrist, um, epilepsy mini fellowship in collaboration with John Hopkins University and Aga Khan University in Karachi. Uh, he's got consultant senior psychiatrist, People's Medical University, um, specially trained for drug addiction treatment and rehabilitation by the Federal Ministry of Narcotics in Pakistan. And of course, uh, Dr. Dahl is internationally certified with the ICAP-1. He is a coordinator and master trainer, and, and I could go on and on and on, Dr. Dahl, but I think hopefully everybody has now got a good flavor that we've got an expert in front of us and who will be giving a perspective from Pakistan. So Dr. Dahl, when you're ready, I think you're going to share your screen and you're going to take over. So welcome. Thank you very much, uh, madam. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Everybody who can feel morning, who can feel evening, who can feel good afternoon. Are you listening to me? I Are think you everybody listening can me? Hear, yeah, absolutely, Dr. Dow. I can confirm I can hear you. And I think if I can hear you, I know our audience can as well. They won't be able to tell <clears> you that correctly. So take it from me. Okay. Trust the system. Go <clears> ahead. <throat> I was allocated the topic dual diagnosis, substance use, and the mental health, dealing with the co occurring disorders. <clears throat> what happens when the coexisting disorder is uh, diagnosed? At that time, the treatment failures are more getting uh, risky to everybody. The, what was the learning uh, outcome for the participants? will learn about the two way relationship between substance use disorder and other psychiatric disorders diagnosis of these disorders and the plane of the treatment what happens once either I, what happens when either the psychiatry came first or the drug addiction come first reason being is that we always hang up between that and we always talk about the relapses we always talk about the poor outcomes of the treatment but we never thought that either a person who is uh, with dual diagnosis either using drugs uh, after having some psychiatric illness or before having uh, some psychiatric illness, he started these drugs. So uh, I, I chosen myself this topic to talk about this comorbidity. The comorbidity is a condition. Uh, sorry, I lost my screen. Oh, yes. Comorbidity is a condition that describes the presence of two or more diagnosable conditions either happening at the same time and having a close temporal uh, relationships. So uh, this all is about the issue what we are going to talk about. Categories of the dual diagnosis, four categories of the dual diagnosis, primary psychiatric disorder, with subsequent substance use disorder, primary substance use disorder with psychiatric complication, concurrent substance use disorder and psychiatric illness, 
substance used a substance used in psychiatric illness both resulting from any traumatic experience which somebody someone uh, have in his real life now we are talking about the what is a dual diagnosis a dual diagnosis means co-occurring mental health issues diagnosis someone present with a psychiatric condition simultaneously or not necessarily caused by or causing a substance use diagnosis it has been said that each diagnosis can influence and exacerbate the other that's why the failure of treatment is occurring and the more relapses of the patient and again there is a great risk of higher abuse higher abuse and that that can lead to somebody to the mortality that's why it has been said by the world that that addicts never grow and they die younger so this is the basic thing that they always get uh, relapses and having problem with their issue and they are not dealt in a good way for example someone attempting to cope with the uh, depressive sym symptoms by drinking alcohol and they later develop an alcohol tolerance <clears throat> there is a very clear correlation between one's mental health and the development of an addiction and each has a good chance to trigger the others substances are commonly used to mitigate the slice to the most severe mental and emotional distress <clears throat> while certain mental health conditions are correlated with the proper decision making and impulsive behavior and substance use difference between comorbid and induced disorder it is it is a very important slide for we all that either the disorder is induced by something or it was comorbid with that during substance use are soon after intoxication and withdrawal symptoms are not enough to be diagnosed as a psychiatric illness in my routine practice what i see in my routine practice uh, on the daily basis what i see the people who are using ice crystal meth and some kind of the in, uh, stimulants some kind of the hallucinogens like uh, cannabis and something else they are exhibiting and showing the psychotic uh, symptoms like suspicious behavior aggression violence restlessness and everything the families those who are not known about the consequences and the co-occurring uh, symptoms of the substance use and we never address substance induced psychosis so we always in a very tough uh, and hard situation to deal with the family of these and so we need to discuss we need to say <clears throat> regarding all these excuse me symptoms not enough uh, amount and the duration of the substance use should be sufficient to produce symptoms symptoms preceded by the substance use symptom persist after substantial period of the time after cessation of the substance use history of prior episode not associated with the substance use risk for development of the substance use disorder mental health america report that the patient with a distinct mental health disorder are at the following rates of the increased risk of development of substance abuse disorder antisocial personality disorder 15.5 percent manic disorder 14.5 percent schizophrenia 10.1 percent almost schizophrenia is reported with the cannabis most probably the cannabis use in pakistan here but while we are dealing with them panic disorder 4.3 and major depressive disorder obsessive compulsive disorder 3.4 and the phobias 2.4 percent what co-occurring mental health disorders are common with the addiction for the decades researchers have been studying co-occurring found some disorder are more common in the dual diagnosis treatment and along with substance use disorder than others the most common mental health disorder co-occurring with the substance use disorder include mood disorder anxiety disorder personality disorder ocd and adhd again all these all these make a difficult feel for a practitioner for the substance use practitioner and for the doctors and for the psychologists and for the social workers 
to deal with their substance. So they need dual <clears throat> approach to address the common things which are co-occurring with that disorder as the patient approach to our clinic or uh, our setups or the rehabilitation center, then always need a substantial and dual support for the proper management of uh, that re uh, uh, detoxification and the rehabilitation. <clears throat> anxiety disorders, almost 18% of the patient with the substance use have co-occurring anxiety disorders. Social anxiety has a sordid link to the marginal-like issues and generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and social anxiety increase the risk of co-occurring mental health issues. For the reason, seeking help from the dual diagnosis treatment is recommended. This is myth in our country, Pakistan, that if the patient who is using substance use a substance and they are always in the denial, they hide everything from their family and they are in the when they are getting very severe and very abusive and very uh, like a diseased form. And at that time, their family rush to the rehabilitation center, rush to the detoxification center and they need, uh, need and seek help to their siblings to their uh, daughters to their brothers to their son to their family members so this is a great dilemma over here in the pakistan i i am not sure about other countries because they are more research oriented and possibly they might have uh, different setups to deal with the dual diagnosis as a psychiatrist uh, we always are trouble with treating a dual diagnosis person because family has a lesser acceptance for the substance and lesser acceptance to the uh, psychiatric illness because the as as we are developing country and having a lot of stigma on us mood disorder nearly 20 percent of the people with an addiction have an co-occurring mood disorder such as the clinical depression and the bipolar dual diagnosis treatment centers give client the tool to find joy in daily life personality again is a is a big dilemma because it is a ingrained type of the pattern once they are with any personality disorder type and they that remains per persistent and they they try uh, almost the antisocial type borderline type paranoid personality type because it covers the 35 percent of the clients treated for the the co-occurring personality disorder the most most problematic is the antisocial and the borderline and the paranoid because they they always have no uh, remorse and the, they are very uh, dramatic and they are very uh, dramatized uh, making people and they seek and they are again against the society societal norms and family norms and social norms and the post traumatic stress disorder according to the national center for ptsd 8 out of the 100 americans are struggling with the ptsd unfortunately the people of the ptsd are 14 times more likely to need dual, di dual diagnosis treatment for co-occurring substance use disorder. The another perspective is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. ADHD is the link to the earliest substance use and the addiction. For example, 20% of the adults in the dual diagnosis treatment struggle with the ADH because we are lacking the child psychiatrist over here and the, the people, those who are ADHD and those who are living with their ADHD and when they are getting adult and they are involving into any of the psychiatric and other antisocial uh, attitude or behavior. So they we have the difficulty to treat and to detox while they are with ADHD or other psychiatric illness. OCD is one of the most common mental health disorder. It causes depression, anxiety and even suicidal thought without treatment because a patient becomes halted, patient becomes overwhelmed, patient becomes uh, uh, over anxious about his obsessions and they, then he is getting compulsions and that makes him more discomfortable in the community in the society and that's why they lead to the societal thoughts and without treatment coping with the system uh, symptoms of the OCT is exhausting causing many other uh, to turn to the drugs or the alcohol because what happens when they are not getting uh, uh, thoughts out of their mind at that time they are rushing toward the alcohol and to other drugs and to make themselves the calm and cool cool and cool so and then then they are getting involved and then they are 
uh, having dependence and, and tolerance to the, that substance. And again, they are rushing toward another type of the substance. Why is dual diagnosis treatment crucial for the co-occurring disorder? It is not easy to determine whether a person's drug or the alcohol use has led them to develop a mental health condition or vice versa. In some cases, people use drugs or alcohol to self-medicate to relieve the symptom of their mental health issues. This is very dominantly happens with the lower socioeconomical societies and developing countries where they seek escape for their problems, when they seek uh, shelter, when they seek shadow to cope up with their symptoms of the, their mental health issues, their social issues, their economical issues, and they are getting, and even though those who are with the sleep disorders, they al always go to have some kind of these drugs to use for it. For instance, many people find themselves turning to alcohol or find relief from anxiety or depression. Conversely, sometimes people abuse substances and develop a mental illness as a result. Meth use and cocaine use for the instances can quickly lead to the anxiety because almost it is a stimulant and this can uh, have some adverse effect to their uh, mind and body. It's often best to attend a dual diagnosis treatment program if you struggle with the both and addiction of the mental illness. If you only seek substance use treatment, for your reduction, it is easy to relapse. As I already mentioned that the relapse is more common with those who are not being addressed with their dual diagnosis, uh, symptom of your mental illness concern unabated by the substance. In our routine practice, we always talk about their symptomatology and uh, uh, what they are showing while they are visiting our clinic, our setups. At that time, we talk to the family that they, got, they developed some kind of the other psychiatric illness, which can make them worse. And even though they can get relapse if they are not treated dually. However, if you only get treatment for your mental health condition, continue to the use substance may quickly result in another worsening mental health issues, as I already mentioned. According to United Nations Office and Drug and Crime uh, Country Office for Pakistan 2007, estimated prevalence of opioid use in Pakistan to be around 0.7 percent of the adult population numerous study hint that an association of substance use dependence with the certain psychiatric disorders a swedish cohort sample reported oh yes uh, uh rates of the coma disorder among individuals with substance use including antisocial personality uh 20 percent psychosis 14 percent 0.6 in was drug induced psychosis as i already mentioned that because our country the people they are using more cannabis and they are uh, facing a lot of substance induced psychosis or drug induced psychosis depression 12 percent uh, and 8 percent of the comorbid anxiety <clears throat> one study concluded that the 47 percent of the diagnosis patient with schizophrenia can have a lifetime diagnosis of the comorbid disease another study reported that common psychiatric condition among youth who abuse drug were conduct disorder attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and the depression a study conducted in nigeria compared to the psychiatric comorbidity over time period psychiatric comorbidity was higher 67.65 percent in seven years period from 2000 to 2007 as compared with the previous seven years from 192 1992 to 1999 38.5 percent in both period comorbidity was associated more the cannabis use as compared with the drug abuse Co-occurring personal disorder, two sides of the same coin, 37% to 90% interconnected to such extent that the past substance use disorder was classified under personality pathology. <clears throat> personality disorder involves four components, as we mentioned, cognition, affective expression, impulse control, interpersonal functioning. Occurring disorder, the cluster A, uh, paranoid personality, schizoid personality, schizotypal personality, because they are eccentric or they are out of their center and they cannot respond well. B, they are bad, as I say, as I say, made bad and said, say, dramatic, emotional, egocentric, antisocial personality, bipolar, uh, borderline personality, stonic personality, narcissist personality, and even though for the same is with the cluster C, uh, uh, depressive personality disorder, uh, avoidant personality disorder, 
and uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. A strong association found by the uh, antisocial personality disorder and bipolar uh, borderline personality disorder. Double insights to the injury gambling disorder in the 40%, bad prognosis, high suicide rate, and forensic issues almost with the bipolar, uh, borderline personality and antisocial. Challenges in management, transference issue, trust issue, over involvement, uh, and uh, resignation from the psychiatrist. Uh, they leave the psychiatrist. Issues related to impulse control, compliance issue, predisposition towards the depression, anxiety. The commonly we use CBT, DBT, group therapy, family therapy, and the role of the SSRIs. But as my uh, the the home tech message could be the comorbid is very common. Holistic approach is uh, for the assessment need team approach used to valid psychometric for the both follow up guidelines for the pharmacological intervention. Never forget suicide assessment. Keep updating themselves. So thank you very, very much. I think I'm on the time. I think. Madam, uh, Madam. Dr. Dow, no, I hear you. And I think you've done a superb job taking us through what is extremely complex, but really uh, lots and lots of information. The slides were wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Thank um, you. I'm thankful. I'm thankful to ISAP Global, ISAP Pakistan. They, they given me opportunity to talk at this August uh, gathering to talk in front of you, all the seniors, all the all, all my friends, or the colleagues. I'm really thankful, and I'm available for answering questions. As according to my knowledge, I'm still a student of you, madam. <laughs> Uh, we're all a student of the world, I think. that's uh, It's always good to be knowing and asking, isn't that right? So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, you're going to go off camera, I think, and sit in the background, um, and then we will have questions and answers towards the end of the webinar. So please okay. stand by, <laughs> and okay. we'll have you on the panel. Thank you so much. Thank, um, thank so you. I'm really, really pleased now to move on to our second speaker, uh, who's going to be giving us an introduction through the lens of Indonesia. Um, we've got Dr. Risa. So Dr. Risa is a doctorate uh, in clinical pharmacology from the University of Adelaide in South Australia. She also has two masters, one in, in Master of Health Science and also a master's in clinical psychology. And having started her career as a clinical psychologist all the way back in 1989 from the Faculty of Psychology in the University of Indonesia. Dr. Risa is current Deputy of Rehabilitation uh, for the Indonesian National Narcotics Board. And um, prior to that, she's been in the National Narcotics Board in a variety of roles, but actually between 1993 and January 2009, she was clinical psychologist for the Drug Dependency Hospital in Jakarta, the Ministry of Health, Republic of Indonesia. Dr. Risa has extensive research and consultancy and training experience, so I'm delighted to pass over to Dr. Risa so that she can take us through basically her experience of this complex area, um, not only from her own experience as a trainer and, and expert, but also with an Indonesian, I suspect, flavor. Dr. Risa, welcome, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Carmel. Can you hear my voice? We can indeed. Everything is good. And I can see your slides on the screen as well. So you're good to go. OK. Good morning, everybody in the morning side, and then good afternoon, and also good evening. Uh, I would like to present the presentation entitled Community-Based Intervention, or we call it in our language, we call it as a, in abbreviation, is as a, an IBM. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to go through the IBM stand for, but at least we, we would like to talk about the community-based intervention as an approach to mobilize awareness of the community and, and also to reduce stigma. Next, please, Olivia. Yeah, there are some of the uh, section that I would like to present. The first one is the introduction, why we run the program of the community-based intervention. And the second is about the effects of substance use disorder related stigma. You, you, you just hear, you just listen what Dr. Dahl uh, presentation. I think you already get the idea what kind of stigma that people who use drugs have it so far. 
And then the third one is I would like to speak about community-based intervention. And the fourth one is the conclusion. Next, please. Yeah, this is the introduction. I would like I would like to uh, talk briefly about this. The next, please. This is the UN ODC drug report that around 36.3 million people at least use drugs once in a year and some of them could be a dependent and required treatment and we all know that the availability of treatment and rehabilitation services not only in indonesia but at the global level is not always uh, easy for them to ac to access uh, next please this is the situation in indonesia i would like to talk about the blue one during the pandemic we increase the prevalence of people who use drugs from 1.8 percent in 2019 to 1.95% in 2020, 21. This is not a, a big increase, but compared to the the population that Indonesia have around 170 million, it is a big deal. So we can see here in the absolute number. So in 2000 2021 20, is about 3.6 million and the common drugs use is our cannabis uh, amphetamine type stimulants and dextromethorphan and common first time drug use is cannabis methamphetamine and dextro average age of for first time drug use is in the village is about 90 years old but in the, in the cities about 20 years old Therefore, we need to have a different approach between the villages and also in the cities. Next, please. Uh, in the background, I would like to tell all of you that Indonesia is an archipelago country, consists of uh, about 70,000 uh, islands providing and uh, the, the effort to provide drug treatment all over Indonesia is one of our big issues, not only because of health service provider is limited and offer burden in providing basic health issues, particularly do, during the, the pandemic situation. And the, the other reason is because of the health professional in health sector somehow uh, uh, about reluctant to treat people who use drugs because of the limitation of the knowledge limitation about the experience and somehow they perceive treating pe people who use drugs is quite challenging therefore uh, the national indonesian narcotic board as a leading institution uh, in treating and prevention drug issues in indonesia we initiated the idea of providing low threshold drug treatment. Low threshold means that we empower local community, we train them to, to be able to acknowledge, to be able to uh, identify people who use drugs at the at the early at the early stage. So th those who are in the experimental or in situational user, not the dependence. So we call it as a in providing primary drug treatment as a community-based intervention program. So the community-based intervention program is not a community community-owned rehabilitation center that usually. Uh, provide the complete service from detoxification, but this is run by the community. Uh, uh, our community-based intervention program is just 
uh, like a prevention modality for the for preventing people for not getting worse in in their use usage of their using of drugs so we 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 didn't set it as a community based rehabilitation program because the program is still in the initial phase although we train those local people we have a specific module for them we don't know we, we don't do we do not know yet their ability in treating people who use drugs however we also put a systematic scientific review to evaluate this program and this is still going on next please effects of substance use disorder related stigma please next please yeah i think we already listened to dr dal before about the possibility of the dual diagnosis or comorbidity and even this become more challenging in treating them and they are get higher stigma stigma uh, from the community and also from from the health professionals and the second point here is yet in many health workers tend to be reluctant in treating them because they perceive people who use drugs as a manipulative person as well as uneasy to deal with so this is the result of a uh, minim uh, could be influenced by the minimum minimum uh, module that they receive when they go for the for the basic professionals in the health professions and then the relationship between stigma and substance use disorder can manifest differently from that of other stigmatized health condition thereby complicating efforts to build social acceptance of people with substance use disorder substance use behaviors are linked symbolically to a range of other stigmatized health conditions such as hiv and as well as aids and also hepatitis c virus and also mental illness as dr dal mentioned before unsafe behaviors for example impaired driving driving and social problems for example criminality therefore people with substance use disorders may experience stigma as a consequence of the culturally endorsed stereotypes that surround the health condition next please yeah where does stigma come from stigma is learned and stigma is transmitted somehow from generation to generation in accurate representation of the illness as itself and then frequent de depiction of mainly negative symptomolo symptomology and mischaracterizations as moral flaws or social evils next please How does stigma affect people with SUD? I'm not going to read all of these pointers, but at least recovery and re reintegration process could be more challenging. Uh, they, they are not easy to access treatment because of the afraid. They are afraid to, to get to be understoodly wrong and then the quality of life of course could be influenced could, could be influenced because of the stigma next please how do we minimize stigma we try to provide therapeutic interventions in the rehabilitation program such as a group based uh, acceptance commitment therapy as well as vocational training and counseling 
uh, uh, all of these are more likely to produce positive effects. And also we put the strategy of communication, uh, effective communication that promotes positive stories and through motivational interviewing approaches with particular target, target groups such as landlords or employers, as well as we educate community and in understanding drug prevention, train community to be a recovery agent in outreaching and assisting pe people who use drugs to receive primary intervention, screening and maintaining their new positive behavior. That is the, how we minimize the stigma. Next, please. We realize that there is no wrong door to, act, to receive any kind of services that might promote their recovery. They can go for the hospital or health service base. They can go for the community community base of the rehabilitation center or community based intervention that we provide. So everybody can go everywhere. Next, please. This is the our community based intervention. We run this uh, since 2019. And uh, for here, hereafter, I called this as an IBM uh, in our language abbreviation. Next, please. IBM is located in red, red or drug prone district or village or rural area. So this is based on the villages. This new community-based intervention is not a rehab program provided by the NGO or the community or the, or the uh, private sector. Yet it is a primary intervention provided by local and trained people and we call it as a recovery agent to identify and also to prevent people who use drugs in early stage such as experimental user or situational user for not going into dependent stage by providing here are some of the the activities we do the out, outreach activity we also do the screening brief intervention to know their own risk we do home visit to intervene the family we also uh, give them a referral to do a vocational or productive activities or counseling in certain or in a designated center next please i already mentioned about this one we do mapping and outreach we do screening we do intervention services we do at aftercare. What about the people who have a comorbidity? Usually we do a referral to the assisting treatment center. It can be in the, at the clinic at the uh, provincial national narcotic board or to the local uh, mental health hospital as well as to the local. Okay. The last one, please. I think that's all of the, because due to the time constraint, uh, I'm not going to finish all of the inter, uh, of the presentation, but I guess all of the idea has been explained to all of you. Thank you, Professor Kamal. That's fine, right. Dr. Isa, that, that, that noise was to say you actually had about two or three minutes left, so I don't want to cut you short. <laughs> if yeah. you would like to just uh, do some final summing up of some key messages, if you have those, then I'm sure the audience would be delighted to hear from you. I would like to go directly to the last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 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 not this one, the, with the table, no, this one. We have a target and availability of the IBM in 2021 and 2022. We call it at the, the IBM that in the very beginning stage, we call it as a conceptual phase. 
and the next phase they, we call it as an embryo phase and next next phase we we have an ibm with the growth phase and developing phase and stable phase and the last one that we already we put as a an ideal one is the independent phase independent phase means that the local government can support them and can guarantee the sustainability of the program in the future it is not easy for us because we have a decentralization in the government setting but uh, nowadays a lot of local government put a lot of interest in developing the ibm in their area i think that's all with prof karma Thank you very much. That is a very interesting table. Thank you so much. I'm glad we managed to get to see that as well. That's uh, Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Risa. I, you've given us, certainly for me, a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm just going to share my web so I can come back on. Um, and particularly at the heart of all of this, as we know, which you very clearly laid out for us, is stigma. Um, and stigma really is our, our greatest our greatest challenge and biggest barrier. So thank you. I'm sure we're going to pick that up at some point in the questions and answers. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Risa to sit back into the back end and we're going to bring forth actually uh, John Bull. I'm really pleased to uh, introduce you to John while he's getting his slides perhaps set up. Um, and just a little bit about John. John is currently the manager of DECA, which is the Drug Education, Counseling and Confidential Advice. Um, that's what it, sound, it stands for. It's based in Sanwell in the West Midlands. John is one of our uh, ISAP UK uh, board members as well, so I'm really pleased to welcome him. Uh, basically, DECA is a young person's drug and alcohol service. Uh, it's been operating since 2008. John himself is a, a British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy registered counsellor with experiences of delivering targeted work and services to adults and young people. And John is also a qualified protective behaviours trainer and holds a qualification in teaching and learning. And John, I believe you're going to give us a taste and an understanding through the lens, particularly of your services and young people, particularly around comorbidity. So I'm delighted to welcome you, John. Thank you. Thanks, Carmel. And um, good morning to everybody. Good afternoon to everybody. Good evening to everybody. It's a fairly huge audience that we've got today. Uh, thanks to colleagues over in Indonesia and Pakistan for their fantastic presentations. Really interesting to hear what's going on, but also really heartening as well, just to kind of hear that the whole world is looking at this partnership working approach to dealing with the sorts of challenges that we face on a daily basis, really. So good morning, everybody, um, from myself in the United Kingdom. I work for DECA, Drug Education, Counselling and Confidential Advice. And really, today, what I'm going to talk to you about is a lot about partnership working and partnership working around young people and also, obviously, mental health. It's World Mental Health Day, so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. DECA are actually part of something called Samwell Children's Trust. That's essentially our social care department. Samwell's a little borough. We're right next to Birmingham where the Commonwealth Games has just been held. And our trust has got social care, so that's social workers. It's got various different services, DECA being one of them. And it's, it really is about a partnership approach. It's about understanding and realizing that the more that we all work together, the more that we can achieve realistically. Now the DECA service is the under 18 um, service. So again, we're the young person service. So we only work with those aged 18 and under. And we're a little bit different to other services in the United Kingdom, because actually we don't just do the treatment of young people. We actually do the prevention stuff as well. So what we do is, is that we have our universal offer. We go into primary and secondary schools and we work very closely with the leadership teams in those schools, the school member of staff, but also with the children directly as well. We work all the way from five years of age, that's year one in the United Kingdom in kind of infant and primary schools, all the way up to post 16, so sort of 17 years of age. What we try to do is, is try and make them aware of exactly what these substances do. There's no just say no approach, that's been proven to not be overly successful and doesn't really work. So what we do is, is that we're honest, we actually have honest conversations with our young people, because again, it's about showing them respect. If we want them to respect us, if we want them to talk to us, then we need to show respect for them too. But there are other young people that aren't involved in mainstream schools in the United Kingdom. And that's where we have something called our proactive outreach offer. We go into those organisations and those providers who work with young people that aren't accessing the mainstream stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff. And again, work with them. 
the reason why we do this is, is statistically, certainly in the UK, these are the young people that are more likely to come through to us. Those that might be in the looked after system, those that might be involved with a social worker, those that are out of that mainstream education. Now, the reason why I mention this is, is because a lot of our referrals come in through these two different routes. So again, our treatment service, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about in a second, is often kind of really in, enhanced by the fact that we go out there and work with these different organisations. Because if we weren't to do that, firstly, how would they know we exist? Secondly, would they trust us? Would these young people think, you know what, actually, yeah, I'm all right to go and work with DECA. They, they seem like a decent enough bunch. So again, it's actually trying to break some of those barriers down if that young person does need that one-to-one -one support. Now, alcohol and drug use, mental health and emotional well-being. Question that I'm often asked is, do all young people who use drugs and alcohol have mental health and emotional well-being issues? And for some, that's a very, very easy question to answer because often when young people are referred into our service, they're already known to other services that deal with these sorts of issues. We have a service in the United Kingdom called CAMHS, C-A-M-H-S, the Child and Ad Adolescent Mental Health Service. And they're our kind of, they really do deal with our mental health issues. We've got a really good relationship with our service in Sandwell. I'm going to talk to you a bit more about relationships later. Um, but we know if they're involved with CAMHS, they are likely to have some kind of mental health issue. That's why they're involved. But now things have got much broader. A lot of our schools now are actually taking on in-house therapeutic staff because it's been recognised, especially since the end of the last pandemic kind of lockdown last year, that the emotional well-being of our young people has suffered, not just in the United Kingdom, but globally. So again, it's fantastic now to see that partners are really starting to take this on board. Realistically, though, for many of the young people that we're working with, we aren't going to know exactly what their mental health and emotional well-being is like at start. We aren't going to know that, essentially, unless we ask. So what do we do about this? Well, in our treatment service, this is what we in-house do. We do one-to-one -one structured therapeutic support. We use a standardised model. There was something in the UK called BTEI, B -T -E -I, which stood for the Birmingham Treatment Effectiveness Initiative. We got hold of it, noticed it was for adults, did some tweaks and changes, met up with the people, a couple of guys called Dr. Aaron Sandy and Dr. Ed Day that had put this together. And we created our own model for Sandwell, for young people specifically, realistically. What we also do is, is make sure that we're looking at harm minimization, because for some of the young people that come into our service, they may well be using cannabis, alcohol, crack cocaine, heroin, but they don't actually know anything about that drug. They only know what it does to them. They only know about their own experiences. And for some, certainly not all, but for some, their experiences may have been very positive up till now. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that word positive a little bit later on. What we also do, and the key thing to starting out any relationship with our young people, is we carry out screening and assessment of all young people either referred into our service by a professional, those young people that self-refer in or those that are referred in via the courts, even if they are already known to mental health and emotional wellbeing services. So again, the idea is, is that we have kind of a standardised way, a standardised approach of working with our cohort of young people. So what do we do in terms of mental health and emotional wellbeing? Well, I could take you through our entire assessment and screening tool, but that would be a bit boring and a bit dull, and I'm sure it'd be a bit like teaching you all to suck eggs. So. One thing I want to kind of point out to you is and just take you through is what we do around mental health and emotional well-being. The first thing that we did when we put our screening tool together, which is about 10 or so years ago now, was take a bit of a step back and go, right, do we need to devise everything from scratch? Do we need to pull everything together or is there some good stuff out there already? And very, very fortunately, we actually found out that youth justice services in the UK have been using something, a standardised tool since about 2003. So really, this was about eight, nine years into them using this. They were finding it successful. So we asked if we could use it. Because one of the big things that I want to say to you all is, is that if you identify a gap in a service that you're providing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to provide all the answers. It doesn't mean you've got to generate all the answers yourselves. What's out there already? Does ISUP have something that you might be able to kind of get involved in? Have you got partners, organisations that you could get involved with? So again, it's really, really important to say at this point in time, 
don't think for a second that it all has to fall onto yourselves. You know, if you're struggling in an area, if you're finding challenges in an area, what else is out there? What else is out there that you can utilize to hopefully make your lives that little bit better and make your clients' lives that little bit better too? Now, I'm going to initially apologize about the fact that these um, slides aren't exactly the largest. I have to lean forward a little bit and I'm the one that's presenting this. But what I want to do now is just take you through the questions that we ask around mental health and emotional well-being. So the first of all thing, it's, it's the mental health screening questionnaire for adolescents. So this is designed for those days 18 and under. So again, if you're going to use something, try and ensure that this is something that actually fits your audience. So the first thing that we ask is alcohol use. Do you think alcohol use, use takes over your life and is out of control? Do you feel depressed, angry or anxious? And then we score it. The idea of scoring it is when we get to the end, if the score rates are something, we know then it needs a referral on. If it's that middle ground score, we need more conversation. If it's a very low score, we can be fairly assured at this juncture, at this time, that this young person's mental health and emotional well-being is good enough. And that might change though. So just to say it's a bit of a sliding scale and we will maybe, and we do sometimes, go back over this screen with some of our clients whilst they're with our service, because things do change in a young person's life, things do change in adults' lives. Drug use, do you think your drug use takes over your life and is out of control? Just the thought of not using drugs make you feel angry, worried or depressed? Again, is there something going on? Is this person using these things for a reason or do they feel as though they have a very huge reason for the use of alcohol and or drugs? Depression, do you feel miserable or sad? Do you dislike yourself or your life? Again, if someone's struggling, if somebody's feeling that way, the chances of us working with them and, and trying to get them to become drug free are going to be impacted upon if their mood is low, if they suffer from depression. We need to look at trauma, PTSD. Do you currently have flashbacks of current past upsetting events which you can't stop? Do you have powerful memories of past upsetting events? An example of this would be, we were with a 15 year old boy, nice lad, um, knew his own mind, appeared to be very much kind of in control to everybody around him. We started working with him. We were working with him around his cannabis use. He couldn't really understand, he couldn't really explain why he used cannabis, but he said he felt sad at some times. What we did was, is that we went back over his lifespan. We asked him about things in his life. When was the last time you think you might have been happy? When do you remember feeling happier? What we identified was, is that this young man had suffered a bereavement at the age of around about nine years of age. And it was, just, it was a significant bereavement for him. And actually, since that significant bereavement, his school achievement had gone down, his relationships with peers and family had gone down, his use of alcohol, then drugs, had actually started at kind of about a year or so later. And what we really identified was, was that this young man was really struggling with this bereavement. So again, as part of the work that we did, we actually brought in the bereavement services to work with him. And it actually meant that that young man was able to discuss what were essentially unknown at that point underlying issues, and was then able to start looking at his use of cannabis and actually working out, is this something that I want to do? Or was this something that I was doing to, to just try and cope, just try and get through life realistically? Now, we ask about anxiety and excessive worries. Do you have panic attacks, overwhelming fear, heart pounding, breathing fast and stomach churning? Again, if somebody's experiencing that, why would they not want to use a depressant drug such as say cannabis or heroin or alcohol to try and make them feel that bit better? Do you feel worried, uh, worries, scared for long periods of time? Again, if somebody's feeling this way, why are they not going to reach out and try and find coping mechanisms? We as adults, um, all in this kind of very large worldwide room at the moment, we may know friends, we may do it ourselves. As soon as we get in on, a, on an evening, we go for a glass of wine or a gin and tonic or a pint of beer or something like that because we just need something just to try and oh, just to unwind through that day. Why would our clients be any different to us? We're all essentially the human animals. So again, if we're young, if we're old, if we're rich, if we're poor, black, white, male, female, gay, straight, etc. Why are we not going to adopt these kind of coping mechanisms? Is there self-harm present here? Do you harm yourself or do you take overdoses? Again, this is something key to understanding where that person is at this point in time. And again, a, a scary question, some people find this. Do you often think about harming or killing yourself? 
But if we aren't asking that question, are we missing out on an opportunity to try and intervene? Then, have you ever had treatment for anything like this? Have you ever seen a GP counsellor or therapist? Have you ever taken medication? Let's find out what was. Was there previous issues, even if there aren't now? Do we need to be mindful of the fact that this client may be more susceptible to low mood, may be more susceptible to things that are going on because there has been a history in the past? Now, ADHD hyperactivity. So again, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Does the young person have long-standing and severe overactivity impulsive behaviours? Are they trying to cope again? Are they confused by feelings? Are they on some kind of prescribed medication, which actually in their own mind has kind of given them the idea that, well, if I'm taking prescribed drugs and that's working, if I get me out of some, some of them illicit drugs, they might be even better for me as well. And then last but by no means least, psychotic symptoms. Does the young person appear unduly preoccupied, suspicious, or frequently misinterpret situations? Does the young person have odd behaviours or appeal to respond to voices or see things that aren't there? Again, if those things are there, we need to get some support for them. We need to get those kind of like services that work around mental health and emotional wellbeing involved. Now, something just to make you aware of as well, and this is, this is a kind of a, a practitioner to practitioner thing, really. We did all this screening, it was great. We identified that there was a need, and then we have a conversation often with the referrer or with the person that's kind of sent this information through to us. We need to make a referral. Sometimes though, it gets a little bit unclear as to who's gonna make that referral. So this is the reason why we put this in the box. When we identify a referral needs to be made, everybody, we then need to work out who's gonna actually make that referral. Who's actually gonna take this forward? Who's actually going to do that? Because sometimes, we can all be aware of something and we can all feel as though somebody else is addressing this or doing something else with it. So again, really important if we identify something to make sure that we're making that referral on. So our clients in our service, just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview, um, there are certainly young people that use to self-medicate. I think I've kind of mentioned that a little bit already. Those that are feeling anxious, those that are feeling miserable, those that are feeling unhappy use of a drug, say for example cannabis, can make those feelings kind of go away or, or, or lessen for that period of time. One of our young uh, crack and heroin users that I worked with a number of years ago now said whenever he used heroin it was like pushing a mute button on the world. He knew what was going on, he knew the problems were still there, he just didn't care for the duration of time that he was high for. And again, I'll be honest with you all, I was a bit nervous about presenting to you all today, if somebody had turned around to me this morning before we all started and said, here you go, John, take some of this, it'll make you feel better. Hand on heart, I, think I might well have tried to do that because again, I just didn't want to feel that sense of nervousness. I didn't want, I wanted to feel calmer. I wanted to feel more at ease. So again, I can certainly understand why young people might want to do this. Also those that try and mask their issues. We've certainly had young people in our service that have drank alcohol because they want to feel more outgoing, they want to feel more gregarious, they want to feel more kind of connected with peers. So they have a drink, hoping that it's going to break down some of those barriers that they're experiencing. Sometimes it does, sometimes unfortunately it doesn't work out quite that well, especially if they tend to drink too much. So again, something to bear in mind. Certainly those that use, uh, that then causes them wider issues with their mental health and emotional well-being. Again, for all the best will in the world, it may well be that young people have thought that the use of cannabis, that the use of alcohol, that the use of ecstasy, LSD, hallucinogenics might have made things better. But unfortunately, actually it exacerbates, it makes that situation worse or certainly doesn't solve it. It also may well in many cases, actually lead to further stigmatization within their communities. Moms and dads not trusting their children. These children are already feeling distrusted. They're already feeling disconnected. Now there's a reason, a, a real reason why that people may think this because they're a drug and alcohol user, so can't be trusted. So again, is actually what was designed by them, hoped for by them to make things better, actually making things worse. And I suppose my last point would be in short, use does not solve mental health and emotional well-being issues for our clients. I don't think this will come as a surprise to anybody out there. But again, this is sometimes something that we really do need to make our young people aware of. Actually, is what you're doing working? And sometimes we have to challenge them. Because if we can very much see if the evidence is there, 
maybe they're not quite waste, ready to face up to this. What we need to do is, is that we need to challenge, but mindfully, empathically, again, in a non-judgmental way, because we don't want these clients to drop out of our service. Best advice, I suppose I wanted to try and put a couple of little bits together for folks today, which was, if your client is known to mental health and emotional wellbeing services, absolutely create a link with them. Give them a shout, find out who these people are, find out what they're up to at the moment, find out what they can do for your service. Again, have that relationship. Realistically, create a link with those services, whether you have clients with them or not. There is nothing worse in my eyes than having an emergency situation arrive on your doorstep. And usually this is after 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon before a bank holiday weekend. Again, if you're trying to contact an organization that you've never spoken to before, that, that is stressful enough for you as a person. You're also feeling kind of anxious because you're trying to do the best that you can for the person that you're working with, your client. So again, if you've got that relationship already, it makes it a heck of a lot easier. Certainly, we would advise screening all your clients to establish their mental health and emotional well-being needs. If they're identified, you can factor this into your work and make appropriate referrals where needed. It's not about passing the book, folks. It's about getting the appropriate level of support. I do what I do. I, I have the experience I have, the qualifications I have, but I'm not an expert on everything in any way, shape or form. So again, why am I going to try to intervene on an issue that I might not be placed to intervene with? Yes, I might be able to do some low level work. Yes, I might be able to hold that client for a period of time. But again, do we need that more specialist service involved? And I think I'm kind of saying this again to our audience, but I think we all work with the client. We work with the person that presents, not the fact that they're a drug and alcohol user. We work with that human being. So mental health and emotional well-being doesn't have to be that scary. It's just another aspect of who that person is. That person is sat in front of us. This is part of that intrinsic person. This is part of that whole person. So again, if we work with them as a holistic package, if we work with that person, with everything that they come with, then our outcomes hopefully should be much more impactful and much better for them. Now lastly, and by my name is Lisa Lee. Um, I just wanted to kind of make you all aware of something. Since the 1st of July in the United Kingdom, integrated care systems are now out there realistically. I was going to try and write a little blurb on this, but the NHS website seems to say it much better. So I'm going to read it out if nobody minds. Integrated Care Systems, ICS, are partnerships of organisations that come together to plan and deliver joined up health and care services and improve the lives of people who live and work in their area. Following several years of locally led development, recommendations of the NHS uh, were established across England on a statutory basis on the 1st of July. Now, essentially, the purpose of these ICSs, these integrated care systems, is to improve outcomes in population health and health care, tackle inequalities in outcomes, experience and access, enhance productivity and value for money and help the NHS support broader social and economic development. And that will lead to improving the health of children and young people, supporting people to stay well and independent, acting sooner to help those with preventable conditions, supporting those with long term conditions or mental health issues, which obviously is the key for what we're talking about today. Caring for those with multiple needs as populations age and getting the best from collective resources so people get care as quickly as possible. Now that to me, everybody, is partnership working at its most intrinsic, at its most basic level. It's about making sure that the person that we're working with gets the absolute best service that they possibly can. So this is just music to my ears. It's very new and again, hand on my heart, I'm not an expert in this, hence me reading the information out rather than kind of knowing it exactly off pat. But this is a fantastic development. I think now that services, certainly in the United Kingdom, are starting to realise really the absolute essentials of partnership working. It is absolutely essential. It isn't just beneficial, it's essential. So that's me, folks, for today. Uh, I know now that we're going to be going on to any questions. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of fielding any questions that you may well have. And uh, as I say, thanks everybody for listening. It's, um, it's a real honour to be able to talk to you all. It's something that we feel really strongly about in my service. Because again, young people in mental health, sometimes it's been one of those things that's been a little bit ignored. Oh, it's for adults, it's for over 18s. It, it really isn't. And certainly, even if we don't look at mental health, even if they don't have a mental health issue, their emotional wellbeing, if that's been affected, will absolutely have an effect on their day-to-day -day functioning. So again, thanks all for listening.
lovely. John, thank you so much and um, beautifully delivered. And yeah, that's quite a complex slide, that last one. Let's hope it really is simple in action <laughs> as opposed to seeing it on, on the screen. Um, but thank you so much. And I completely agree with you in terms that, um, you know, thankfully we are starting to pay more attention to the younger population and particularly those under, under 18, under 16. And all of us know that actually childhood trauma leads to the unhealthy adults. So if we can do some work before they get traumatized, uh, then that's really where it's at. So, um, but thank you for the work that you and your colleagues are doing. So we, we have, I'm just looking at, we have about 12 minutes uh, for questions and answers, which is hopefully reasonably enough to get in a couple of key questions. I do have one that um, I'm going to just pull up for myself just in terms of, because I've been keeping an eye on the questions. And just to say, there's a couple of sort of basic stuff people are asking, and it's really great to see a lot of people interested in this field, a lot of people very interested in ISAP, which is great. Um, so uh, well done, ISAP. Um, they're interested in jobs and how to get into the market, so to speak. So I'm going to just, for those of you who really want to work in this area, uh, think about this area, ISAP does offer quite a lot of opportunity around training and certification and, and so forth. So please do check that out and then call directly to the main colleagues like Olivia and Kirsty who sit behind along with Joanne who is the CEO and I'm sure that they can guide you around employment opportunities. The other one which people are asking and you may have missed it as we open the virtual door is this presentation in its totality is being recorded and will be available to download and to revisit and to forward to, to colleagues so please don't fret it will be available and all the slides that you've seen uh, this morning afternoon evening they're all going to be there uh, and ready for you ac uh, to access. So if I might, and welcome back colleagues, Dr. Reese and Dr. Sal, uh, sorry, Dr. Dahl, um, that uh, we're going to open it up to the floor. The first question is actually to Dr. Risa, and it is from Raffaella Milani. Thank you very much, Raffaella. Um, and basically, thank you for your interesting community level intervention. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Very interested to know your take on how many or the uptake of training from the community. You mentioned employers and landlords, and so they're interested really, how did you get them to participate in the program, uh, you know, et cetera. So if we start with that one, how did you actually, given we've just come off the presentation on partnership and the value of that, but how do you actually get those people to come on board? Could you share a little bit about that? Yes, I tried to explain. Uh, we, uh, uh, can you hear my voice? Okay. Uh, we, uh, uh, our uh, head office in, in Jakarta also have a provincial office uh, at the provincial level as well as uh, in the district level. So through the, our, through our provincial and also uh, district level, we, we try to persuade and we try to advocate the local government about the importance of the local governments to pro, to provide the uh, community-based intervention for for the their own people, because it is part of the responsibility of the government to provide the service. It's not it's not fair if they only rely on the uh, availability from the head office, from the from from the Jakarta office. It's, it's very hard for us to provide everything in, in in every islands. So by but by, by persuade the local government that this is for your own people, then it is making the 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 local government interested into to provide this. And the second one about how to how we recruit the local people, we collaborate with the local government and the local government actually, uh, the person, uh, they, they're responsible to, uh, to persuade their own people at, the, at, the, at their uh, area to be able to go into this kind of program. And we have, uh, uh, honestly, because uh, honestly, we 
the ideally we we need to have a person to person training actually but during the pandemic it is very hard for us due to limited budget and also the pandemic so we also provide with the virtual training it's very step by step and also we have uh, around five days of, of training for all of the activities how to oh. screen people, how to screen people do uh, using that their dust and mm -hmm. and how to to do a motivational interviewing that is also the whole day we 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 train them and wow. so quite a, quite extensive it sounds so so in yeah. in in summary the the key issue is that obviously with you know very diverse and uh, expanded populations particularly given you have the the many islands of course and there will be many that will re will recognize that if you are uh, a country that's very large in population but also has many rural areas i think that people can recognize not everybody can do everything one more thing Carmen. uh we also um, uh, we also empower our uh, office in the provincial level as well as in the district level to be a clinical supervisor for the for yeah. the community so a kind of train the trainer it sounds like yeah. a train the trainer sort of roll out to support yeah. people and to build to build the workforce and the support and scaffolding fantastic yeah. thank you the, there is a part two to that which is uh, in terms yeah. of your program that you described has there been any opportunity yet for longer term impact evaluation i'm going to suspect not because it's relatively new but it's also quite a difficult thing to do and takes a lot of money and follow-up but can you speak to that is there any any at least uh, initial data coming through about the effectiveness of what you're doing uh, yes they are uh, okay uh, if i'm not mistaken because i cannot recall the numbers and also the statistic we did the evaluation on the motivation as well as the as the as the frequency of the use of using of drugs and there is a decreasing of the using of drugs as well as the increasing the motivation to deal with the formal rehabilitation yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just mindful of time um, and I just wanted to pick up a couple of other questions. One which I think is quite an interesting one, which is why not actually ban every substance? Um, why not control even for the drugs that are legal like alcohol and tobacco and would that assist or support us? I wonder if anybody has a view. It's kind of a political, slightly political, but also an interesting point socially. So um, either Dr. Dal or John, do you have a view? Just uh, just even in, in 30 seconds soundbite, what your view is with regards to a response to that? It was, it was a very nice uh, uh, presentation and it was a nice presentation by uh, John Bull and uh, and Riza, and even you introduced things in a good manner. And uh, uh, I'm not sure about my presentation, but I'm sure about their presentation. They, they went very comprehensively, and it was a good sign that we gathered and we spread out our knowledge to other common people, and they will get a lot of benefit. And so this should be replicated this this practice should be replicated by the ISAP global and the ISAP local country heads and the country chapters. No, I, I, I agree. Maybe Dr. Dow, I wasn't clear. The question was more about whether we should um, le stop all legal use of drugs, even alcohol or tobacco. Would that assist our communities? So I'm just wondering, given that there are drugs, there are illegal drugs and legal drugs in many countries, there was a question from one of our audience about whether we should just reason, ban all drugs. The reason being is that we cannot stop these because they have the monetary benefits to everybody and they are the drug traffickers, even at the some extent on the alcohol and the smoking, they are get smoking cigarette. They are getting good type of the revenue. They are generating a lot of taxes. So it is very harder to go for that. This is again, as you mentioned that, this is a political question. 
Yes, no, <laughs> fantastic. I think I think that um, I, John, I might. I, I think. Do you want to say something, particularly with the youth in mind? <laughs> <laughs> I think Dr. Dahl kind of summed it up. Unfortunately, there's so much money involved in these things. Again, I mean, I think the first reported use of cannabis is something like 250,000 BC. Um, so these things have been going on for 250 BC, sorry. So again, these things have been going on for such a long time now. And again, a lot of people use them and they enjoy it. And I think, unfortunately, trying to get rid of something that people enjoy, even if it then turns into something that actually isn't helpful and they don't enjoy, if it starts out as a pleasurable activity, it's just going to be really, really difficult to ban things like that. So I think that whilst, you know, it, it, waving magic wands would be an amazing thing to do in certain areas, I just don't think that would be realistic, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I think I love love that love that that point. It's very difficult. The genie is out of the bottle. I think is another phrase that people often say. We need to just uh, empower people to be able to make good choices for themselves. Um, I think um, one of the other questions that's coming through, which is the stigma and the the, the larger issue of stigma, and I know that. ISAP are very interested, of course, in this, and we may even do, do another webinar specifically about stigma. But is there, from your different perspectives, ways of how we can start to really work and raise awareness yeah. around that? Would anybody like to pick that up? I know Dr. Risa gave us a lovely presentation, but but Dr. Da. Uh, the, while we are fighting with the stigma, because uh, nowadays, as previously in the last decades, while we were with uh, fighting with the HIV and something else, and there were a greater stigma attached to that type HIV. But uh, mm. nowadays, uh, those countries which are uh, under the development and their uh, their communities, they are not well aware about the about the real awareness and advocacy of the disorders and uh, psychiatry. And even though about the because what happens to in our country, it is a very miserable situation because they hide their kids uh, with any disorder. They hide their patient while any of their uh, any of their activity in their house because they feel that the people what the people they will say and even though they are going for the engagement of their siblings and they are being hired by the family if they're going going for the marriage of any sibling that the patient they are being hired by the family so it it needs a holistic approach and as i believe myself three people in the world they can change the world one is the mother, one is the teacher, and one is the religious uh, scholar. The proper religious scholar, one is the teacher, and one is the mother. If we can train them and we can work them so they can reduce the stigma, and uh, uh, these things should be replicated in order to reduce at the lower level. As I am the master trainer and the coordinator for the mental health care program in the Sindh and Pakistan, so I, I gone through I trained more than 1,000 doctors and uh, 1,500 paramedics regarding the 10 disorders as the world uh, WHO said the World Mental Health Gap Program, uh, which is uh, turned to the primary health care. So, uh, in that perspective, we ICE uh, global and ICE local country level offices should consider the things should be done at the primary health care system, at the government dispensary, at the mosque at the religious point, at the schools, at the primary level, at the intermediate level, elementary level, and at the higher levels. So we can fight with the stigma because the stigma is the basic thing which leads to the, which is worsening the situation. What happens, they hide their patient and they're not seeking the treatment. And again, the burden is coming on the economy of the world, on the economy of the house, on the economy of the country, and everybody is getting dysfunctional of either by the psychiatric illness, either by the uh, substance use disorder. Yeah, no, I, I think what a comprehensive response, Dr. Dahl. Thank you. I'm, and, and I don't think, um, I'm sure my panel members would not disagree with that because it kind of went right across the, the scope of what we need to do, particularly in this really challenging space. Um, I'm just so aware that we've actually just slightly overshot our time. We're supposed to try and wrap up by 11.30 uh, UK time. I suspect everybody is busy today and I don't want to put any further burden or hold you hostage to the event. So I am actually going to wrap up the session. I'm going to ask my panelists if they are happy because we have a number of questions still outstanding, not answered. If my colleagues Kirsty and Olivia send those to you, whether you might make a response to those and then we will post those up as part of the post event 
uh, information. So thank you for everybody who actually posted questions. Thank you also for attending. Looking at the numbers, I think at one point we just touched 300 participants, which is fantastic. Phenomenal numbers, obviously clearly a, a, an important area for, for, for discussion and conversation and certainly for action. And I wish everybody um, well Mental Health Day, the best of mental health uh, to you, to your family, to your communities. And thank you every, everybody for your interest in this subject. Together we hopefully will make the difference. So thank you. Have a fantastic rest of your day, wherever that may be, um, and, and take care of yourselves and others. Thank you so much. Thank you, panelists. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Carmel. Thank you. See you again.